Professor Murdoch, I have a uh, discrepancy. So on Canvas, I'm um, supposed to be an anthropology, and on the um, syllabus, it claims that it's in bracket 131, but I think that was a misconnect or something. Okay, and on which syllabus? The syllabus for anthropology 3530. I'll show you. I'll show you right here. Does it say bracket slash till now? Sorry about that. Anybody else here for forensic anthropology? I guess somebody else. Yeah, you're welcome to stick around. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know anything about that. Yeah, uh, yeah that's do what? What's a registration for? Okay. Sorry about that. That's a, that's a good somebody had to be in the wrong class. Just a good people. It might be next to syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, good. Let's get started. Um, I guess just to start off, this is um, groundwater and contaminant transport. Um, so hopefully, everybody is here for that class. Um, and you know, what I'd like to do is to start off just by, um, by talking about what I want you to be able to do after taking this class. So, Presumably, everybody here has an interest in um, groundwater. Uh, and so the objective, what we want to end up with after we're done, is to learn more about groundwater and be able to. Um, well, here, this is what you'll see on the syllabus um, working knowledge of hydrologic systems and on solving problems related to groundwater. And then in the syllabus, it, there is some more stuff about the more details about the, the maps. I guess, in, in my view, um, you're here because you're interested in groundwater. Um, this class is at the um, graduate level, senior undergrad. You're soon to be, um, you're fairly far along in your education, soon to be. Um, out working. So presumably everybody here has an interest in uh, working on um, in the groundwater area to some extent, either as your major focus or as uh, a, 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 as something that you're involved with to some extent. And so what I want to do with the class is to uh, give you the tools to get started on, on solving problems related to groundwater. You're going to work in this area Professionally, you're going to be working on problem solving. Um, and so this, this class will get you at least an introduction to those tools um, for, for doing that kind of work. And I'll go into a little more detail uh, about just what I have in mind. Um, but I think by way of getting started, well, actually, before we get started with this, what I have in mind to do is actually I'll, I'll talk about what I have my I was going to talk about the Zoom and, 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 and that, but I think I've got a slide to talk about that. So let's just get started then with uh, some hydrogeology. So uh, this is campus, and I like to write on my slides, and I have to sometimes careful that I don't actually write on that. Um, okay, so here's campus. And uh, in, in this class, we're going to be dealing um, primarily with groundwater. The groundwater will interact with surface water. So We'll see that it's really all uh, 
one, one hydrologic system, but we'll be focusing primarily on groundwater. Um, so this is uh, a, a, an aerial view of uh, campus. We're right here, Racket Hall. We're kind of looking east. Um, so here's, here's the lake. Um, downtown is uh, downtown is right in here. Uh, there's Bracken Hall, there's Tillman, there's the field in front of Tillman. Um, there's the stadium. Uh, and what I've done here is to uh, highlight various um, locations where there are um, or were uh, tanks that held um, what, what we'll call maples, non aqueous phase liquids. Um, gasoline is a maple. Um, so these are uh, some gas stations. Uh, and then also um, dry cleaning fluid is a napple. So there's a dry cleaner up there. On campus, there's a motor pool here. Um, so they had, they stored some gasoline there. Same with over here and probably some, some other places as well. Um, and so I point these out because these are uh, sources, these napples are uh, one of the most common sources of groundwater contaminants. The tanks that are uh, used to store napples leak uh, and the, the gasoline uh, or other napples uh, get in the ground that, that uh, the, the napple uh, dissolves and gets into the uh, groundwater and uh, creates groundwater contaminant plumes. So uh, in the hydrogeology area, understanding uh, contaminant transport and understanding how to deal with these plumes is one of the big things, one of the big problems that we will end up solving. So these are pretty common problems because it turns out we store a lot of, of these maple fluids um, pretty commonly. And, and in the vicinity of campus, we have a dozen or so we can point to. So we've got some, some fairly common problems uh, that need to be addressed. And so in order to figure out what the problem is, one of the things you're going to need to know is how the groundwater is moving. And so what, what happens at campus, and we'll, we'll take a look at this in some pieces, we've got to make models of this area, but the groundwater um, there, there's a groundwater high, a divide right around here, right around through Bracket Hall. And the, the groundwater that's recharged over on this side um, flows down. There, there's a, um, th this is a, a former river here. Um, it's cut off by a dike right here and right here. And then there's a stream that goes around like this. Um, and here's a lake. So the groundwater district is this lake, a little stream that goes up here, there's another stream that goes up there. So the groundwater system around here, we have recharge that comes in uh, across campus, and then we've got groundwater flow that it, it, uh, it, it, it propagates away, it goes away from the divide and ends up going to these various streams. So We've got a groundwater that flows like this, um, like that, and some that would flow down here to this stream. Uh, and stream that goes like that, so the groundwater flows to that stream. And over on this side of the divide, the groundwater is flowing to these this small headwater streams, but they're perennial streams, so we've got groundwater uh, flowing to them. So, when we get contaminants introduced at these areas, if, if there is, I'm not saying that there is, but if, if, there, if there is, they form plumes that go along with the groundwater. And, um, and typically what they would do is flow along or around here, they would flow along fairly shallow and then discharge uh, through the streams. And that ends up creating some problems because that the, the contaminants um, uh, create health problems. Uh, for humans and uh, also in the environment. So there are various risks 
that are associated with having contaminants in groundwater and dealing with the problems associated with those risks is one of the main things that um, that, that water geologists get involved with. All right, so so much for campus. That, I mean, there are some potential problems that could cause groundwater contaminants. I just wanted to point those out to show you that, that these issues are, are pretty common. But what I want to do is, is show you now a kind of much more spectacular um, scenario. And for this, we're going to go to a place that is um, it, it, kind of an unusual place. This is in Kentucky. This is called the Paducah Gaseous Fusion Plan. And so this is it, also from the air. Um, and you know, it's kind of hard to appreciate it from this, this picture because uh, it's hard to get the scale. And that's a mile. So this is about a square mile. Um, and there's the Ohio River up there. And gaseous diffusion is a process that we've done at this plant. Um, and it's kind of an unusual process, this gaseous diffusion. Here's a little graphic of it. Um, this is a, um, that basically what you do with this process is you take uranium and get it into the gaseous phase. Um, and then the, the gaseous uranium will diffuse at a rate that's proportional to its weight. So the different isotopes of uranium have different weights and they will diffuse at different rates. Very small differences, but if you then have a very long length over which it will diffuse, you can separate them out. So that's what's going on here. You put, you put uranium in here, it diffuses, and you get the heavier stuff here that's enriched and the lighter stuff there. And you need big, long lengths to do this. So these buildings here have these big, long lengths of this uranium fusion. This is a, a Department of Energy facility used to make enriched uranium. I mean, probably for, maybe for nuclear power, but also for weapons. Okay, so it's, it's it, I mean, you don't really see these kinds of facilities around everywhere. It's kind of an unusual place. But it's also um, one where there's been a lot of work and, and some, some pretty spectacular um, problems. So as part of doing this, and this is an unusual problem or an unusual process, but what's not unusual is that as part of this industrial process, they use a solvent called TCE, trichloroethylene, very common solvent, works really well at cleaning you know, greasy parts. They also use this radionuclide called technetium, which is kind of unusual, um, but, but this stuff is, is really common. Most industrial facilities used it as, you know, at least historically, probably, probably not so much anymore. Uh, but historically, it's very, very common. So at this place, right in here, what they found was that there was some spills of some TC and techniques. So TC is a, a NAPL, a non aqueous phase liquid. Um, it's a solvent. It, if you put it in with water, the phases stay separate, but some of that TC dissolves into the water. It's just in very small amounts, but it's pretty hazardous stuff, it's pretty toxic. So it'll dissolve into water at high enough concentration, so it's a problem. And that's what happened here. So that was the place where there were some spills and, and some leaks. And then um, the, the thing that happens then is when you have places where you have some contaminants getting in the ground, then these kinds of questions are what come up. What are the risks of these contaminants being there? Um, and how could there be exposures of uh, things that we care about to the contaminants? Uh, and then to address those questions, then 
we would we would ask some other questions. How are the contaminants moving? Um, where are they? How fast are they moving? Um, and how might they then interact with um, things that we care about, like people or the environment? And then what can be done? What could be done to uh, improve the safety, reduce reduce these risks? Okay, so these are some of the questions, and really to start addressing some of these questions, what you need to do is, uh, this, I, I would say this is probably the the starting point. Where are the contaminants, and then how fast are they moving? So, what you do in if, if it looks like there are some potential leaks or some potential problems, you go out and start looking for them. And you do that by drilling holes in the ground. That's typically how it's done. There's not really a way to detect contaminants in groundwater reliably um, with remote methods. So you drill a hole in the ground, and that's what we've done here. They started drilling holes around here and uh, finding contaminants, and then um, going out and drilling more holes. And so ultimately what they came up with is that uh, the contaminant, uh, a contaminant map um, of, this is this TC compound that I was telling you about, uh, TC distribution looks like this. So here's that little source area. Um, and this is, uh, this is the result of drilling many holes and measuring the concentration in groundwater, and then contouring up the resulting data. And here's the scale. Um, you can see these, these concentrations are right here. Um, once you get uh, out away from the immediate source, you're having down in these concentrations. So all of these concentrations are the, the it's, it's falling, it's evolved into the groundwater and moving right along with the groundwater. So if you saw this, it would just look like uh, water, with, uh, but it would have these compounds dissolved in it. And so what's happening here is that contaminants are getting in the groundwater, and the groundwater is flowing through the subsurface, and there's one uh, major flow path that looks like this and goes along like that. And then you see this funny kind of, I don't know, looks kind of like that, that shape. What's happening there is that um, this, this thing here, this is a, a, a plume, a groundwater plume, and it's going along and the groundwater is discharging to the stream here. So it's going into the subsurface, moving through the subsurface, coming up and discharging to that stream. And, and this, this curve here is, is where the stream is. So this is one plume, and uh, it, often these contaminants are, are introduced like right at a groundwater divide. So it's like the worst place you could do it because the groundwater is flowing in this direction. There's a divide right here, and there's uh, the groundwater also flowing then in this direction. And we have another plume here. This plume just has kind of a rounded snout, so it's still in the subsurface. It hasn't come up to discharge to the ground surface, but it, it's, headed, it's headed down here towards the, um, towards the river. Uh, and then there's another plume here that goes and there's a little stream right in here that it discharges. So there are these three plumes and then there's also something going on here. Um, and either there's another source of contaminants right there or there's some kind of connection between a plume that's going like that and, so um, here we have this plume. It's almost three miles long um, and has very high concentrations of uh, TC. And so we return to our questions. What are the risks posed by the contaminants? Um, and well, I mean, there certainly there would be risks to anybody with a well that was drinking water in the vicinity here. Um, there also would be risks. These contaminants are discharging to streams. So there would be risk to aquatic ecosystems. Um, exposures could occur through wells, drinking water wells. 
um, or uh, surface water um, exposures. These contaminants are moving through the groundwater um, in the subsurface, and we see where they are, how fast are they moving. That's something that we would need to um, do some more hydrogeologic investigation. Basically, what's happening here is the contaminants are moving with, these contaminants out here are moving with the groundwater. And so the first step is to figure out how fast the groundwater is moving. Um, the contaminants, these, this kind of contaminant is usually going to be moving a bit slower than the groundwater because it's interacting with the uh, porous material and that causes it to um, slow, to be transported a little bit slower or sometimes a lot slower than the groundwater. And then what can be done to improve safety? So this is a huge example. Uh, I mean, this is a big plume. A lot of, a lot of tap plumes are much smaller than this. Um, but the, the question about improved safety, the, um, I mean, the, the, the issue here is, is how do you fix this thing? This is a big problem, but how do you fix it? And, you know, it seems like the, the way you would do it is, this is the source of the contaminants. So you got to get that, you got to fix that, you got to get that out of there. And then you have these plumes, and this is contaminated water. So you have to get that out of there. And, you know, you might put wells in here and pump it out. Um, you, in some cases, you could put in um, reactive chemicals that would react with the, these compounds uh, and break them down. Uh, Basically, you're going to have to remove it um, or destroy it in place or immobilize it. So those are the options for remediation. Um, and these are, these are basically the things that we'll talk about in the class. Try to understand how, how to tell how groundwater is moving, um, how fast is it moving, where is it going, how do contaminants move along with the groundwater, um, what the problem is, and then uh, how could we use the, the methods and, and info that we have to try to improve safety and fix them. Here's another picture of, this is this technetium 99, the different compound, and you can see this main plume here, it's pretty similar to the TC plume. This one is also pretty similar, but this one is quite a bit different, and, the, and, and this plume that we had out here for you see it's, uh, it is not, the technician is not following that one. So not only do we have it, so we've got kind of mixed contaminants, multiple contaminants moving around and causing problems that are, or causing plumes that are uh, similar in some respects and, and different in others. Okay, so that's, that's the challenge. Um, and that's gonna be, one aspect of things that we'll look at in class, but you know th that well that particular example is is pretty it's a pretty exotic place. Um, there'll there'll be a lot of other examples of contaminant plumes that are that are smaller and and, and not quite as spectacular, uh, but then there are also a lot of other applications that we'll be interested in. Um, for uh, problem solving and, and how to challenge it. Here, here are a few of them. So in South Carolina, there are, according to the statistics, there are about a half of the people in South Carolina use, uh, use groundwater for their drinking water. Um, so domestic water supply is, uh, is, is a, a, an important issue. Uh, in some places, uh, I've got a I've got a friend who lives over in Denmark, and they get 100% of their drinking water from groundwater. So, um, very, uh, very important resource for just providing the basic needs for, uh, for people. Um, and the um, industry uses groundwater as a, a source for, you know, that's a cooling power. So, there are various industrial applications because sometimes you would bottle water and sell it, but uh, you also use it for, uh, for various industrial applications. One of the things that they use groundwater for around here, um, there, if you go drive around through the countryside here, you'll notice that they have these uh, big chicken farms, big 
tried chicken coops. Um, and so one of the things that, that you need for a, a big chicken coop, um, chicken farm, is to have a water supply to, for the chickens to drink and also for cooling. So one of the one of the ways that they locate where they can put these chicken farms is, is where they can uh, where they can drill a well that's that's quite a productive well. You, you, you need a, a well that produces water at a, a rate that's, that's really on the high end of what we can do around here. Um, so groundwater is tied in closely to the various industrial applications. Um, and then I think that's the ecosystem. Yeah, and, you know, understanding groundwater, important part of, of the overall ecosystem. Of course, aquatic ecosystems are going to rely on groundwater because the, it's the groundwater that's discharging into surface water. And that, that is um, going to be the reason that a lot of surface water is there in the first place. Um, and so where you don't have that happening, then there are going to be uh, problems with uh, that will impact ecosystems. So important aspect with, uh, with, with aquatic ecosystems, but just in, in general, I mean, any kind of ecosystem is going to have to have water that it relies on, and, and groundwater will, will be an important uh, source of that. Uh, agriculture uh, for irrigation. Um, a lot of agriculture worldwide is, is really tied into irrigation. This is, you probably can't really see that too well, but this is a picture of, of Southwest Kansas. And each one of these little green dots is a central pivot irrigation system. Um, it's one of these things. Uh, these, are, um, these, are, these are circles that are half mile in diameter. So they've got a quarter mile long arm that spins around like this and, and applies water to the crops. And at the center of that pivot is a, it typically is a well. And so these kinds of systems are installed over productive aquifers and they pump the water out, pump it down along these um, distribution systems that spin around and form these circles. So in Southwest Kansas, there's, it's very arid there, but there's a fantastic aquifer underlying that area that they use for this irrigation. So it's made that area very agriculturally productive. So that's the good news. The bad news is that in a lot of places where this is done, in arid areas, you're, you're, you pump out more water than is going in. So you have a big sustainability issue when, when you do this. Here's an area, this is India. Uh, and this is a satellite imagery that measures the gravitational field. Um, and the, if you measure gravitational field with high enough resolution, you can see changes in the water content in the aquifers. And when the groundwater gets pumped out, the mass is reduced and that affects the gravity field. And this is a, a, a gravity low that's caused by water that has been pumped out of this region. And this is a big deal because this is, area is a um, big agricultural area for India. Um, and it's getting depleted. The groundwater is getting depleted. They, they use groundwater as a, as a major resource. It's getting depleted. Um, and that means that the food supply in India, you know, one of the highest populations in the world, is the food supply is coming from here. And, uh, there's there are problems with the groundwater that's used to, for irrigation. So um, there there's some you know, some very important aspects related to groundwater uh, and agriculture. Okay, so um, the last one here is is uh, construction. So you know a lot of these places water is used as a night as a as an important resource. Um, here's a resource here. You, you got to have it to have your ecosystem and agriculture. In construction, you know, a lot of times here, water is a nuisance. If you're building something, a lot of times, I mean, I guess if you're building a dam, then, then water is not a nuisance. But a lot of times when you're building things, water is a nuisance and you have to figure out how to deal with it. So 
here's a picture that I don't know if you can, you can really visualize this, but this is a big this is a big hole in the ground lined with concrete, um, and here's here's a, a lake, a river, some surface water, and this is way below uh, this surface water. And so, in order to do stuff like this, you're gonna Actually, this water is going to want to come into this pit, so you have to figure out how to do dewatering, get rid of that water in order to do construction. So here's here's another example of an application for uh, energy gel. How do you figure out how to keep areas dry that that you want to where you want to build this? Okay, so those are some applications and some reasons why you might want to know the topics in this course. Here, here's what. Here's what I want to do in kind of an overview. So for hydrogeologic problem solving, the big thing that we need to do is learn how hydro systems work. So the basic principles of how things work. We've got to also be able to communicate about hydrogeology. So there'll be a variety of nomenclature, some terms that we need to agree on. Uh, we got to be able to measure stuff and get data and, uh, and figure out what that data means. We want to learn about some techniques for making measurements, some uh, field measurements, some, some uh, analysis, how to do calculations. Um, computer models, it turned out in, in hydrogeology, we can make models that work pretty well, pretty well, um, of, of the flow and, and the transport of, of contaminants. Um, so that's an important technique that we'll look at. And then also, we want to put all this stuff together. Um, and use it for um, solving. So here's just some graphics. Here's some your model, um, some field work, making some field measurements. Uh, all stuff we'll, we'll talk about. So here's what we'll do for the format of the class. Um, you know, I went and updated my slides from last year. This said this said that the lecture is going to be on Zoom, um, and so I updated that. And, Lecture won't be on Zoom, hopefully. We'll be staying in person. That would be my preference. Um, but I, I did set up Zoom and I have a camera pointing here. So there will be Zoom. I, my, my intent, at least at this point, is to record the lectures. And uh, if you can't make it, then the, it'll be up on Zoom. You should be able to, to tune in. Uh, and, and also uh, get the lectures afterwards if you want. Um, some of the meetings that we'll have will be in the field. We have, uh, we have, we have a couple of well fields out in, uh, around here, uh, and we're going to meet there and try out some things uh, in the field. Uh, we'll, our first meeting in the field will be in um, a couple of Couple of weeks. We'll start off pretty soon uh, getting out to the field and you know seeing some of the stuff that we're talking about in the lecture. We'll also be using software. Uh, I want to introduce you to various different types of software that are used in hydrogeology. Um, Canvas will have uh, class material there so everybody can get on the Canvas site. Um, We'll have some videos that are used for some of the content, um, particularly with the software. Um, I, I find it just easier to learn about how to use software with uh, videos. The homework will be homework due each week, uh, and it'll be um, it, usually it's going to be due on Friday, and it'll be due through Canvas, uploaded. Uh, so check out Canvas. Um, if we make if we're gonna make changes, uh, we'll the uh, homework it'll be done through Canvas. There's a syllabus. The homeworks are on the syllabus too, but it's kind of cumbersome to up, update the syllabus and hand out a hard copy. So this is kind of just preliminary. It'll it'll be pretty close to this. We may make some changes um, as as we go. So here's the syllabus. Um, my office hours are after this class. On Wednesday, uh, but you know, if you if you want to contact me or you know you want to talk about something, just email me. Um, I also have office hours by appointment, so I 
should be able to get me pretty easily by email. So if there's a TA, uh, Austin, Jen, she'll be, um, she'll be working with us. She'll show up here in a couple of classes. There's a the tech type, slide hydrogeology by Fetter. Um, we'll have some of the readings and homework out of that text. Um, so that'll be, that'll be needed. Uh, here's the distribution of grading. Some, be some homework, there'll be some quizzes, perhaps some um, as we go. Just expected to be in class. You can take a look at the rest of that stuff. Um, here's on the last page, here's the list of topics. Um, and we'll, this will be pretty close to what we'll do. Um, the, we might make a, a few adjustments here uh, in the middle of the class, but this will be pretty close to the, the topics. Um, these arrows are when we'll be in the field. Um, and I'll give you a advanced warning. Usually, where we're going to go is uh, down the trunks and bottoms. Um, so uh, it's within walking distance from here, the class walker. <laughs> Okay, so kind of an overview. Um, what I'd like to talk about with the remaining time is just you know, we need to we have some kind of background to start with. Um, and a good one is just the hydrologic cycle. Uh, so this is something that, that quite many of you have heard about and so I, I just want to go through this. I want to introduce some of the terms that I'll use uh, just so everybody's on the same page. So the water cycle, the reason why we're here, uh, I don't know why water does interesting things is from this cycle. Um, and this is a, a nice USGS uh, graphic. And, and basically what's happening here, the important thing is that, that we have energy uh, coming in uh, Heat thermal energy coming in from the sun, I call the water, uh, largely the oceans evaporate and, and, and rise. And, and that gives us potential energy. Uh, and then when we have precipitation, um, we've got it's raised, we've got, we've got potential energy, and that potential energy we turn into uh, it, flow. So we've got flow down back to the ocean, uh, some of it goes into the subsurface. Uh, and, and travels through the subsurface as, as, as groundwater. Um, and then the, and we'll discharge the surface water, uh, and, and that'll be the, the primary part of the overall cycle that we're right? So if we look at that in a little bit more detail, a little bit closer, um, and we look at it from just from a surface water perspective at first, then uh, this is a, this is what we would I think everybody recognizes a watershed. This is the, these are, here's some streams, and then here's the discharge point from, from these streams. And this thing here, this is probably some kind of topographic divide. So, you know, if you put like a, you had a big ball and put it down here, it would roll down in and on these streams. And anything that was put in here would end up rolling out through there. Uh, and so this is topography. If you put the ball here, it would roll out this way. So that's what we call a surface, surface watershed. Um, here's some other examples. Um, and and we'll, this will be interesting, but we'll also be interested in what I would call a ground watershed. Um, and that's going to be somewhat different than a surface watershed. Uh, if, 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 we, if we were to do a cross section through here, let's just, let's just take a cross section. Uh, Big. Well, it's going to be a cross section like that, except um, let's do it like that. Except I'm going to flip it around. So let's call that A and A on. Okay. And so we do a cross section through there. And So there's the stream, and well, let's see. There's the there's the, the surface water divide, 
And then we look, this is a cross section. So we're looking through the surface. And then this is the water table. Um, and I'll draw this little triangle and sometimes put a little line through it like that. But mostly it'll just be a triangle. And that'll mean that the, the pressure is equal to zero there. So that's the definition of the uh, water table. That's where the pressure is equal to zero. This is the stream, and the surface of the stream is also where the pressure is equal to zero. Um, and we can see the water table here is, is, is sloping. Uh, the high point is right here. So water is flowing this way uh, on this side of the high point and this way on that side of the high point. So this is the groundwater divide. And this is the surface water divide. And you can see they're not in the same place. There's no reason why they should be. Sometimes they, sometimes they are, often they're pretty close to the same place, but they're not really um, any reason why they need to be. So we've got this system where water's flowing to the stream here on that side uh, and to another stream over here on this side. So that's um, kind of the big picture organizing principle. Um, and then if we look at this sketch in a little more detail, uh, here I've drawn in some more of the uh, more arrows, and these are these are are, are a flow paths and and things of interest, processes of interest in the hydrologic system. Uh, and so, what I'd like to do is to draw in. I'm going to go through a quick scenario on what's going on here, just label some uh, processes and some, some terms. So let me just, let me just go like this. I'm going to draw this guy. So there's the screen. Uh, and here's the, so there's the water table. And so what do we know about the water table? Pressure is zero. That'll be on the final exam. <laughs> so write it down and, and you know, not everybody will get it either, but hopefully you will. Okay, so here we go. This is, this is our, our, our system and uh, a tree there. What I want to do is to take a look at what happens when it rains. Okay, so that's going to be how water gets into the, the system. And so we'll go through just the scenario. So at the beginning of the rainfall, um, the rain is going to fall on these trees. Uh, and, you know, if you're out here hiking, and it starts raining, it starts raining at, you know, at first you're not getting wet, right? Because the rain is landing on the leaves. And, and that's, that ends up being an important thing in, in the hydrologic cycle because that water is never really going to get into the, never going to really interact with the subsurface. Um, it'll evaporate away first. So this is called interception. When that that uh, water rain beginning of the rainstorm um, falls uh, and, and, and basically gets intercepted before it gets into the, um, into the hydro system. So sometimes you know, sometimes have water just in puddles. Um, but what's going to happen then is, is the water ends up, uh, it gets stored here, but it, it, it breaks through all the, all the places, all like the little, um, leaves and stuff that it intercepts on get filled and then it then it breaks through and starts landing on the, the ground. So um, when when the water first lands on the ground, it's going to go across the ground surface and get into the subsurface. So that'll uh, what we call infiltration. 
then as soon as the water lands on the ground, that's that infiltration will, will, will start. Um, assuming that you know the permeability, I guess an exception would be if it's falling on a room or a blacktop, you know, something that's really low permeability. Um, then what happens if the rain continues? Um, then uh, if infiltration continues, the water content here is going to increase. And if the, if the rainfall continues or, or maybe it increases in, in magnitude, then the surface can become saturated and you can have flow over the ground surface. So this is only going to happen after the rain has, has occurred for a while, but we would, we would call that overland flow. And another thing that is going to happen is uh, often in the solar horizon, we'll have a deep horizon in the soil. And the, the deep horizon is going to be where the clay content is a bit higher than up here at, at shallow depths. This, around here, the deep horizon is uh, maybe half a meter to a meter down. Uh, Clay content increases, and what that causes that causes the water to infiltrate and then flow uh, in the downflow direction. So that's called interflow. Or sometimes subsurface. And so what we end up with then is during the rainstorm, we've got water that's flowing in the downslope direction in the subsurface and potentially in the surface as well. These two are lumped together uh, as storm flow. And what happens then is that this can go right down into the stream. This could downslope and then probably it's going to going to discharge and you know often when you're when there's a hard rainfall uh you can you, you might not see any overland flow until you get down at the base of the slope and then there's water seeping out here and then discharging into the stream so the storm flow component gets into the um, into the stream and that's going to be an important uh, aspect that um, that's going to call the water level on the stream so rise uh, during, uh, during flight. Okay, so we have rainfall and uh, infiltration and what can happen during the rainfall or afterwards is the water that gets into the subsurface continues to move downward. It gets through the B horizon and if it makes it to the water table, we would call that recharge. So water that gets into the water table and recharges it, it'll cause the water table to rise, like so. Um, and then the rainfall stops. We have the sun come out. That's causing this stuff to evaporate. And the, the trees are going to be and uh, pulling water out of the subsurface. And that's a process called evapotranspiration. And I also will just abbreviate that EP. And so most of the rainfall around here that falls uh, ends up back in the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. Some of it makes it though and makes it down to the water table to recharge it, and the rest of it is going to get into the streams as storm flow. And then this groundwater is slowly in the stream, so like this. So this is the groundwater component. 
and it flows along and discharges here um, to the stream, uh, groundwater discharge. What, what we find is that this groundwater discharge occurs um, continuously and forms kind of a base flow um, to the streams. And in fact, this groundwater discharge is called base flow. So the stream has base flow coming in from the groundwater, and it has storm flow coming in from these components. So when the sun comes out, we, we have this pulse of water that comes in from rainfall. Maybe it recharges here, it gets stored in the groundwater, it gets stored in the soil. ET pulls that out, and then flow to the stream also causes it to be depleted. That continues until we have the next rainfall. Um, so we have this process of uh, filling up the, um, the pore space and the aquifer and then, and then draining out. So it, another, another important place is above the water table, this is called the beta zone. Okay, so here are some terms. They're also in the handout. There are a couple of other terms, I think, in that handout. I'm just going to assume you know the terms, and I'll use them as if you know, your your this is these are just like basic terminology that that you can use. But this new you maybe go over the handout. Make sure you're up to speed, and we'll take it from there next time. I don't know. It should be. They, they order it. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you'll need, I'm not going to be able to post all of this stuff in this from copyright. Yeah. I have posted some of the homework. But there's no be reading that you'll need to do, so you know, I can't I can't post the whole okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm sure it's close enough. It should be uh, like a powerful. Well, oh, just the class itself. Okay, check it. Check it right here. It might not be. It should be there. So I've been trying. I didn't really post, I didn't really publish it until about an hour, hour ago. Oh, so so. It, it, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. yesterday. Yeah, I didn't know. I know I hadn't gotten it yet. Check it out. Let me know if that. Let me know if you want to see it. 